Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Overnight Success. My name is Oluwa Mayawai Dowu, and today I am joined by talent agent Taiwo Adeyemi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. So when we have these conversations, I usually start by asking my guests a slightly silly question. Okay. So if you had to pick one, a time machine or a teleporter, which would you pick? Wow. A time machine. It wow. wasn't that hard. Why? So many things I need to fix in the past. So many things I want to adjust in the future. Um, and I think that having control over time is the supreme. Okay, I agree. It's supreme. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mai Waido. I'm a lawyer, writer, and journalist, and I'm also editor in chief of Culture Custodian. Overnight Success is an interview series where I speak to some of my favorite creators and entrepreneurs on the journeys and stories that got them to where they are, that is, young, successful people doing interesting things. I don't think there's any such thing as an overnight success, or is there? Find out more by watching this video. And when you're done, please subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, and share it with as many people as possible. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Overnight Success. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, you're a twin, obviously. Yeah, I happen to be, but don't ask me what my twin sister is because that's a long ass story. But I'll tell you, so I'm a twin by birth. Okay. But my twin sister okay. died at birth. Okay, I didn't know that. Now, my mother, my parents in their wisdom, thought it was smart to still call me Taiwo. Okay. For whatever reason, I don't know. But I think it's selfish interest. They wanted to preserve the memory of the fact that he had twin. Now, everywhere I go, people always ask me, Where's your twin? Where's your twin? So for the longest time, I always say, she's fine. She's fine. <laughs> but in 2017 or 2018, my immediate sister got married. And because I lost my dad, so I had to walk her down the aisle on a wedding day. Yeah, people assumed that was your twin. And it went viral. Because I said my sister... You know, so the new answer to... Where's your twin? It's, oh yeah, she's fine. Because that's there. Yeah. Yeah, but like, yeah, I don't even know her. <laughs> that's interesting. Anyway. But what I was actually getting to was, what was it like growing up in Ibadan? Okay. It was, it was a mishmash of um, poverty and aspiration. You know, like Ibadan is a, it's like, if you, if you're, trying to build something for yourself and you don't want the fast life of Lagos, you also don't want the slow life of like Abiyokuta or somewhere. Like, yeah, Ibadan is like the you know. fine balance, yeah. So, my, my mom and my dad work in the medical space. So, like, my dad was a pharmacist, my mom is a nurse. And I always spent a lot of time either in their pharmacy or in the hospital. Yeah, and I feel like I fell in love with Ibadan because of the peace, the quiet, the fact that everybody just knew each other. I fell in love with it until I started to dream big, you know, and the ambition started to take, <laughs> take over. And I knew that there is, you know, but it's very laid back and it's, it's to their own advantage. Yeah. Right? It's very laid back. But if you want to take over the world, it's not for you. So I had a friend who moved to, they were in Lagos, obviously been here for a long time. Then I think after the pandemic, they moved to Ibadan for a year and the plan was that they were going to stay there much longer because obviously more bang for your buck yeah. you can you know with what you spend for like <laughs> a one bedroom apartment on the island if you do that in but on your it's like a it's crazy. hotel it's crazy yeah but after a while like after a year he, he came back to lagos and he said he couldn't hack it there because it was too laid back that he could feel his sense of ambition just like gradually just dulling away because life was just too easy. So he felt like he had to come back to Lagos to come out of school. I did think in Ibadan, like so many things. I tried to, in my own way, build up the city. Um, I did conferences, I had a TEDx license, I even did events. Like, mm -hmm. And every time you do those things, you realize how much work you have to do to drag people out of their house. Interesting. Like, it's it's unbelievable. I even was on radio at some points. Yeah, I had I was like a co-host on a show on Beat FM in Bado. Okay. And we would give away movie tickets 
and you have won the movie ticket. Can you come and claim it? It's still going to be a still going to be like they literally don't want to come out of the house. And then they have this unwritten curfew of yeah. like eight pm. Yeah, it's yeah. Really quiet. Yeah. So it's I tried. I like I I'm grateful for the for the relationships I built in Ibadan. My mom still lives in Ibadan, so I'm, it's home for me. I I go to Ibadan as frequent as I can. You know. Um, but I'm waiting for the relationships, for the opportunities that happen while we're there. If we didn't go through that, we won't be here. We won't be here. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that leads me to obviously moving to Lagos. So when did you move to Lagos, and why did you move to Lagos? Well, I moved to Lagos fully in 2015. Okay. Fully. But before then, I'll come stay in my friend's house, see the city. Why I moved to Lagos was the themes I was trying to build did not exist in Ibadan. There was no ecosystem that I could plug into. There was no reference for anything, you know. And I was also trying to build a career in advertising at the time. So mm -hmm. I I went to an advertising school and then when I came out, there's no single advertising agency in Ibadan that I know of, you know. So if, if I wanted to do that, I had to be in Lagos. So I, I, I moved because the opportunities for my career at the time were here. That's, that summarizes it. Okay, so you spoke about obviously wanting to work in advertising, but if I'm correct, you actually did some graphic design work. Yes, so I, I started as a graphic designer and um, well, I went to advertising school after and then, oh, by the way, I dropped out of school. Yeah. Okay, T so, yeah. talk to me about that. So uh, that's a very important part of my story. Okay. So it was so funny. I didn't know I could do it, but I, I was, my parents insisted I study civil engineering. Why? Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So first of all, I'm the only boy. I have three sisters. I'm the last child. All my three sisters were in the arts and social sciences. And there was this thing about being a man and being in the sciences. Mm -hmm. I can't explain it in Africa, right? They're like, your sisters, did art, you a man. You also want to do art. Yeah. So yeah, even though I was painting as a child, they saw that I was very creative, all of that. They still said I should go to sciences. And I went to the sciences now. And um, I then I had a brother-in-law who was an architect and was successful at it. Like he had money. So my mom would always say, see, see, do civil engineering so that you know you can plug into that. Yeah. So I went to do civil engineering in Osho State University. I, I knew from the first day, <laughs> from the first day, that this is a waste of time. But I tried, I tried to, you know, stay in class, I did all of that, but music was also getting my attention, so I had a... Were you, tiny, make, were you making music? Tiny music career in school, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's another, <laughs> like, life entirely. So I would be going to, like, nightclubs or going to shows just to go and, you know, meet other people in the industry at the time. I even... I even interned with Ben Gadienka, okay. uh, you know, because he was very big in Ocean State with his concerts and everything. So, first year, second year, third year, civil engineering is a five year course. Mm -hmm. um, third year, I was already zoning out. You know, I already knew. I'm actually surprised you made it that long. I did make it that long. And people always like, why did you not just finish? Two years is a long time in civil engineering. I, didn't, I was feeling right. And I know how smart I am. And if I'm feeling at something, I shouldn't be doing it. You know, like, yeah, it's because you're not applying yourself. You yeah, know, okay. I just didn't care. I'm like, what, what's this mathematics? <laughs> like, what, right on, like, what, what's all this mathematics? I just want to do arts, right? So third year, I stopped going to classes for like almost an entire semester. My parents didn't know. But there was a nosy friend who, I can't remember, no, maybe knows my sister somehow on Facebook. And they went to report me to my sister. And my sister calls me and I'm like, well, yeah, you are not going to classes. At that point, I didn't even write the exam of that semester. So that's why I knew that I was done. You're done. Yeah. And then they called me home in the panel. Right. Intervention. Intervention. That after I was... And then they gave me an undertaking to sign. And that undertaking, I still have it. It's now a motivational speaking tool. I have one of those too. You have it? <laughs> Like, you have decided to forfeit your academic pursuits. 
despite our investment in you, whatever happens in your life is yours Just to bear. <laughs> mine was. And it was a signature. Mine was. So, I don't know why I did this, but there was a point where, when I was doing work, I went mm -hmm. to tell my parents that I don't want to do Yoruba, take the exam. Because basically what used to happen was everyone used to fail. You get the F9. Maybe the best person get like a D7. I had the one in Yoruba. Bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Bad. And I was like, you know, I don't want the F9, man. Can I just, <laughs> can I just absent, not do the exam? And my father thought it was the most arrogant thing he had ever heard. That you wouldn't know your That like as far you think you're too good <laughs> to go and write an exam, your mother tongue. Like as far you you really I, think you I really think points. you really think this is a brilliant. But well, you have to do a language, you know. They knew French. No, I mean, but so eventually they they were so mortified and irritated by that attempt that I got an undertaking that basically said if I didn't get good grades. I will drop out and go to a public school. Like as far they'll send me to like say you think you're a, you're, oh you think you're God. a Bataki, like you go yeah. to a public school. And it's crazy because like I had that undertaking in my drawer at home. So I have a picture of it on my phone. I do, I, I and I, I okay. definitely have it around somewhere. Yeah. But it was like a, yeah, if you don't get good grades. <laughs> I would I, look at it. Yeah, are you because this is what this is what this is what happened to me. Because you. look at God. Yeah. Anyway. I, I didn't I didn't drop out because I wanted to be a vagabond. So I always had that caveat. Like yeah. I knew exactly why I was living. Like and immediately I left, I went to advertising school. So I went to another school. It was just not the conventional way. Yeah. And like and I've gotten so many certifications and all of that. But I wanted to gather knowledge in the things I really you wanted to in. do like with my life. Yeah. So you went to the Uto Academy yeah, and did. did took a art course direction, in art yeah. direction. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the the first week I was in that program, I knew that ah, now you are talking. You are now, now you are talking because this is really what I, you know, writing copies, designing, and all of that. My friend that taught me Corel Draw and Photoshop while in Ibadan, um, in UI, I used to go to his. Uh, so that's why people think I went to UI because okay. I, I lived in Ibadan and I'm friends with everybody, you know, in UI. But he, he had taught me that, and he came in very handy when I was in advertising school. And I was always just knocking off like creatives here and there. So I, I made some money with it because even when I le left advertising school, I had some interesting clients um, that would just say, oh, let me knock off this logo, 20K, 10K. <laughs> and I was doing that. <laughs> and it was, it was making sense to my mom. No, it wasn't making sense to my mom that I'm making some quick cash because yeah. of this skill. I'm like, well, wait and see. Yeah. So the same skill led me into advertising because in advertising, like there are art directors and there are copywriters and there are yeah. strategists, right? Art directors are people that do the creative the most, like put together all of that um, campaign. So and that was where I was. And there was an opening at an agency in Lagos. My friend, God bless his soul, Uche Ugo, introduced me. Yeah, Uche he passed, passed away last year. Yeah, this year. Was that okay? Canada. I remember. Yeah. I remember when he passed yeah. away. Okay, yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was yeah. that was that was yeah. that really hurt because yeah. I didn't know yeah. him, but yeah. it was, was crazy brother. seeing yeah. how much impact he made. Yeah. Uche was my brother. Uche was the one that said, this, "I'm working at this agency, and there's an opening for a design lead or whatever." And I came in. I interned for like three months and. Bro, it became, I grew so fast, like, it was unbelievable, even to myself, that why, why did I, in, in like a year, I was already creative director, you know, it was a very fast growth, so I left the another agency and then to another agency, until I knew that 9 to 5 was not my calling. <laughs> okay, there's something I've kind of picked up around, about you, kind of just from like doing research, and so it's like, I wound up on your medium articles, and there was one particularly about like building a sense of vision and clarity. Yeah. So as someone in your case who had like all these interests, it's like I'm doing music today. Yeah. I'm doing advertising tomorrow. Yeah. How did you build your like your sense of vision and clarity? So um, I understood very early that I am not meant to do one thing. Okay. 
um, my creativity is very, very packed that needs a lot of expression. So very early I knew that in whatever way till I die, I will constantly express and this might look like different things, but to me it's one thing. Okay. Yeah. So for me that was already clear purpose. And I didn't even, okay, we'll probably get to how I got into talent management, but like I, I constantly, when I left school, I found some people that also left school and I started understudying, you know, Richard okay. Branson was on the top. Yeah, of yeah, list. yeah. Richard Branson was on the top and I read everything that Richard Branson ever wrote. You know, if I, if there was nothing I he had out that I hadn't read and it made me understand how similar I am to him. Mm hmm with the, his creative expressions, the number of virgin X that he has, yeah. and somehow it's still very present. You know, and I, and I just knew that like, I'm just going to constantly let this creativity flow out of me in whatever form it takes, I will, I will embrace it. So today I'm doing something in film, tomorrow I'm doing something in music, but like, again, it's the creative world. Like creativity has no bound. And tomorrow, if uh, Louis Vuitton says I should come and be creative director, for example, like, and I don't know anything about fashion, I can do the job. Because okay. it's, the same, it's the same expression. Okay, and now uh, that leads me to the question. So how did you now find yourself as a talent agent? Okay, so there were people like me who had, who didn't know how to figure out their career when I was in school and when I left school and when I was in advertising and every every step of my life, I, I always saw creatives that just needed help. Okay. Every time. And for whatever reason, I come across as very helpful creatively. Um, I, I help people, people figure things out. I help people, oh, you want to start a new brand. I'm helping you name it. I'm helping you build a strategy to go to market. I'm helping you do all of that and I don't get paid for it. I bring people together. I'm introducing you to this person. I was literally doing everything that managers do, but I didn't understand what it was. I didn't have a title. Mm -hmm. But something interesting happened, right? After my agency life, I, I got a job with the AMA Awards. Mm -hmm. AMA Awards is the Africa Movie Academy Awards and it happens every year. And the time I got this job, it was happening in Kigali, Rwanda. So they flew me there and we started working. And because of the film award, I was meeting a lot of actors, a lot of actors. But before then, while I was in agency, a friend of mine who we had met on Twitter or something, Tommy Wasage, walks into my agency and says, I need you to manage me. I'm like, first of all, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Second of all, your manager is somebody I really respect at the time. You know? Yeah. I'm like, why would you leave this person? And this, this clueless person is who you come to. That you come to. And then told me something that set the pace for everything. He said, if you can sell brands, you can sell talent. Yeah. yeah I'm like, hmm. Now that he puts it that way here. <laughs> so, like, I didn't know that was what I was doing, but I started following, following Tommy everywhere. He's an MC comedian, so we go and host this show today, we go to this school, we travel. And I liked it. I just liked it. So when I was at AMA and I was meeting actors who kept on telling me that you money talent, I was just like, ha, you people, you are not serious. Though. You want to come and entrust your entire career in my hands? But like, they were very persistent. So I, I now started reading about talent management. Troy Did you watch Entourage? Did I watch? Did you watch Entourage? So funny story. I didn't watch Entourage until last year. Okay. Yeah. But point is that I started reading so much. Like again, I knew that I needed to prove a point to my parents with this education thing. So I was educating myself in to the extreme. So like it got to a point where I actually felt like my brain was full. Like, so I was just reading everything, you know. And when I got the agency job, sorry for taking you back, and I was earning some good money, and I told my mother what my salary was. She was convinced that I was doing Yahoo. Like, she was convinced, you know. I'm like, well, in this our line of work, they ask for portfolio. 
they didn't ask for CV, unfortunately, unfortunately, right? So I, it took a while for her to understand that, okay, this, the creative world has changed, you know, uh, anyway. So I read Troy Carter's book, I was watching everything on YouTube. Troy, Troy Carter's one that managed Gaga? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Troy Carter was literally like my, he doesn't know me, <laughs> but like, he mentored the life out of me. So like I went, I was just following him everywhere, stalking him. Then I found Scooter Brown. Then I found Dari Manuel. Then I found. I now understood what it was to be a manager, and I loved it because I totally enjoy being behind activities. Like I don't want to be in front, right? So it just fits what I was optimizing for in my life. And okay, so another question I'm very curious about: as a talent agent, manager, rep, whatever. What do you look for in the talent you work with? Not talent first. Let me just start putting that. That's, on, I understand that. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's, it's never the talent. There's something. I've been trying to find the word for it. I was in a meeting this morning and I was trying to explain the same thing. There's something I look for. I know it when I see it, but it doesn't have a name. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to No, call. I know what you mean. There is something, there is, there's an aura that I just, I can just sense that this pen is going to be big and even the person might not know it they might not look like it and i have an uncanny gift in recognizing that thing okay can i ask a question yeah as you look at me now do you see it in me <laughs> don't let me you are alive <laughs> don't let me break your heart you <laughs> see there's a type of power that doesn't need a spotlight okay you are that kind of guy okay yeah interesting yeah but it, there's just something, and some people call it energy, some people call it star power. Like, but I, it doesn't capture the essence of what I'm talking about. But like, that's the first thing I always look for. That's how what I see in the person's feature that I don't even see them seeing themselves first. Then character, very important. Um, discipline, very important. Like I, I try to stop when anybody reaches out to me for management and we are talking. There's a stalling strategy to let them unfold because I want to see you unravel. Interesting. <laughs> for the good or for the bad? Because making decisions, management is like marriage, you know? And you can't just jump into it without the courting stage, without the dating stage, without the talking stage, all of that thing. Um, agency is a bit different because you don't need to be that committed with the person you're representing. You just bring jobs and bounce. But management, you have to build with the person. and. If it's not somebody that you connect with on a very, very strong level, I, I know my clients, my married clients, for example, I know them, I probably know them more than their spouses know them. That's how intimate the work is. Because first of all, your career is taking more time than your family life, mm -hmm. which means I am I'm yeah. very much involved in all of those things. So I look at this and then we now look at the talents. Yeah. Um, sometimes, when the talent is overwhelmingly great, it can overshadow these things. And then we make a decision to represent, and then you realize that, oof, again, talent is never enough, you know. <laughs> yeah. But those are the things I look at. Okay, so, um, one thing I kind of notice is that you're not very loud in who you represent yeah. and who you work with. But there's one that I think obviously is very pivotal to your story. Yeah. And that's yes, Inse Ikbi Itim. Yes. And obviously I've seen your account of how that came about and it kind of... Oh, you've seen that? It's on your medium. Oh. Okay. I shall found it. I talk a lot there. Yeah, I found it. I found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but and it kind of takes us back to you working at the Amas. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that relationship in the context of how it is that you guys came to work together and how that relationship has been sustained. Nse is very special, right? Um, and she's one of those people that I knew her talent because yeah, I worked on TV, um, but like I didn't represent her because of the talent. She's just special, right? How we happened? I was creative director at the Amaz, we're backstage, she was hosting that year, mm -hmm. and we're backstage together, talking, and we just connected. Actually, there was, there was some form of a middleman. She had somebody who was doing her socials and everything, and who had introduced me to her. I just could not resist, like, 
to share what I thought about her and her brand and her career and everything. And at the time, she was already like out of the industry on the editors for like four years, five years, because she had a health challenge she needed to deal with. <clears throat> so I was there convincing her that she should make a comeback, and she was like, nope. You know, and I was convincing her. And she was like, well, if I'm going to make this comeback, will you manage me? I'm like, no, 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 hold on. <laughs> this escalated a bit too quickly, right? <laughs> but she wasn't joking. So we ended Amas, came back to Nigeria. She went back to England. That's where she lives. That's where her family is. But we, we just kept talking. We were talking for like three months. And every day she asked me to manage her. And I was deflecting and dodging and... You know, it's, it's hard to believe that somebody like that, like, thought I was, I had something, you know. I, I was, I wanted to ask her, do you know what it means to be a manager to you? Yeah, yeah. Because this is, this is a decade of career. Yeah. That you want to put into this. Small three, boys. Did huh? you guess, right? So, but she just kindly persisted. And one day I was like, ah, let's even see now, what's there? Yeah. And then we started working together. And it was very hard at first, to be fair, because it's in, it's it's almost an impossible task to champion a comeback in an industry like Nollywood. Because you are gone for three months only. Your space is taken. And there are other people that are constantly coming into the industry. You were gone for five years. Ah, like, mom, this is hard. So and I told her, I remember telling her that the first thing you need to do is to tell this story, own this story. Mm -hmm. Because there have been so many rumors about why you've gone, you know, so... And it's what happened to her was something she believed that she was going to die with. But like, I convinced her to share this story. And it was, it was a young child that happens to a lot of women, right? Mm -hmm. She can't have a child, yeah? So, um, so I spoke, to, I spoke to everybody, spoke to her husband when I was telling her to come back. Uh, and she kind of reluctantly agreed. And then I organized this very small meet and greet. I mean, after five years, everybody wants to connect with their darling and say, right? Mm -hmm. So I fly out to Lagos. What she didn't know is that there was an entire, it was an entire room full of press issues. <laughs> so I'd already put um, media guys in the room. And I also called a friend who I know that she's willing to open up with Femi Jacobs to curate the conversation. It was on my birthday, actually. So that I was very, very, I was very yeah. busy that day. And Femi starts asking her questions. So oh, have you been? The room is quiet. Everybody's recording. And then he just asks, what was wrong with you? <laughs> why did you leave? And because she, that's why Femi was the right person. She can't say, oh, I don't want to talk to you about it. Yeah. She started talking. And she started talking about how she was sick and how she almost died and how she, she had an, an hysterectomy and all of this, right? And I saw the room. I was in one corner. I saw the room. You know when you see people's expression? Yeah. Go like this. People didn't know how to take it. There was shock. There was different forms of emotion. But it became a deliverance session. People were crying. And what she didn't know she had done was actually set some women free because there were people in that room that day that had this same condition mm -hmm. and had been figuring should i do the surgery should i not one pastor said i should not do it this was it then she, she just connected anyway long story short this event finishes everybody goes back to their different places of work nobody published any story <laughs> because i don't know maybe they were afraid they were processing it it took like a week nobody was like god what does it happen Tell the story now. And then it started coming out slowly and started taking the internet by storm. But there was still a lot of doubt until she did the BBC Pigeon interview. Okay. Where she sat in front of a camera and yeah. said it and that scattered everywhere, right? So yeah, she had the attention, but what do you do with the attention? That's why I didn't figure out. <laughs> All my strategies stopped at telling that story. What do you do? when everybody now knows what has happened and everybody's like, oh, we love you. My phone was buzzing, everybody was calling. 
You what? should. Uh... <laughs> Who's booking you now? Yeah, it was the work. Nobody's booking you. You know, first year nothing, second year nothing, and we actually had some issues. Uh, see, you promised me that if I could, uh, uh, nothing, no. you know, nothing, and it made me realize how much you know. You don't have to. Nobody said you pay your due only once. They said you pay your due, but there's no way they said how many times. Yeah, you know so. I was witnessing somebody at incest level, like one of the best to ever do it, paying her dues again. Yeah. That was very surreal to, to witness, right? And we walked our way back to the top and thank God. How has our relationship, what has sustained it? Trust. I, and I feel like, like any kind of relationship, trust is the most important ingredient because being a manager, and also seeing all the bad rep that managers get. Um, there are so many fraud issues, there are so many, it's just, it's just really bad, right? Somehow, we play open book to each other and she just trusts me. And I literally have, power is not the right word, to convince Insia to do something or not to do it. Because she trusts that whatever I'm insisting that she does is for her, is for, is for her own good. So trust has been the, and then she became like a big sister. And people don't know that Insa is going to be 50 this year. I, I saw that. Yeah, she's not a yeah, young I saw woman, that. right? So there is also that um, brother, sister, mother, son, different the relationships are multifaceted, right? But trust has been at this, at the center of all of it. So Insa becomes a proof of concept yeah. of like what you can do, yeah. what you can do it with, yeah. and. I think what makes the story more interesting or more makes it more resonant is the fact that she did come back and she did become bloody bankable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like she took her space. Uh, yeah. She so like, yeah, like she's record. she's she's like consistent. She's yeah. won awards. Yeah. She's delivered um, in obviously some of the biggest Nollywood movies. Yeah. I mean. The biggest one last year. Yeah. yeah. So and the uh, biggest one this year. Wait for it. <laughs> energy. Yeah. And I think like you know, there's nothing that is like sweeter than success. Yeah. And this leads me back to one of your expressions of the journey to success, which is the Road to Blood documentary. So that's a documentary you did to kind of showcase upcoming talents and the process that goes into, mm. you know, blowing. Mm. So, why was that important to you? It was COVID though. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sound philosophical about that one. That one was, I was stuck in the house for months. And I was like, is this the end of this industry? Like, no shows, arena shots, every, every business gone. And I was just there like, ah, how will I eat? You know, because if my clients don't eat, I can't eat. Manager work is commission work. Yeah. Nobody pays me any salaries. And even though, yeah, the incest success kind of spiraled into everybody in Hollywood wanting me to represent them and all of that, but it's not enough money. Like, talent management is very thankless. Very, very thankless. You have to do it because you genuinely like to help and support talent. When you do it at a big scale, yes, you can make a lot of money, but there's no structure that even accommodates that kind of scale for management in Nigeria. It doesn't exist. In fact, yeah. man managers are by force in Nigeria. Like, we insist that you talk to a manager in Nigeria. Abroad, if you don't have a manager, it's a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> Here, if you have a manager, it's, ah, you know. So it wasn't, it wasn't a way to build sustainable wealth. And I really like, I want to be rich. So I started thinking about other ways to express again. But there's a problem I have. Everything I try to do is always some form of legacy driven, passion driven. I always forget about the business model of it. About, uh, Which is thing. ironic, because you need to work it. Yeah, do. because I make sure that every other person gets the business right. But for myself, no. But Road to Blue was that pandemic idea that after everywhere was quiet, I was just thinking, I don't know. I can't even picture, I can't remember that flash of thought that made me like figure out how to platform this kind of emerging talent. I know I had a failed music career. I know I have friends who are struggling to make it. I just like, 
it didn't start as a documentary, it started as a game. You know, at the time, Clubhouse was popping, there were, there were all these digital platforms, and I was like, what can we do to connect people in entertainment together? So, but that idea didn't fully form. And I, I, like all my ideas, I, I spent time on it, I incubated them, and then it started evolving. Okay, why don't you just speak to these people? Why well, do you speak to people when the world is locked down, you know? So it took some time until um, the pandemic phased out a bit before we started doing it. And when we started executing, it became important. It became clear to me why the project was important. Because I'm like, there are interviews everywhere about famous people. Mm -hmm. Like there are, if you want to learn anybody's story that is big, you just take a Google search. Yeah, Road to Blow became important because I knew so many talents that they are not, I, I, I struggle with the word upcoming because these guys, they've put in 10 years, they put in 12 years. Mm -hmm. They didn't start yesterday. It's just that they didn't pop, but they've been here for a long time. And those, those were the focus of Road to Go. It was not like brand new talent. We're trying to tell the stories of people who have spent time, who have put in the work, and still they are not like where they want to be. And every, every day when we started filming this project, it, it was just becoming clearer to me. It was, it was getting clearer by the day. And I'm like, oh, wow, this, this, this had to be done. This had to be done. So it didn't, it, there was no eureka moments at the initial stage. It was when we started moving on it that it started becoming clear. And it's, it, we spoke to about 14 people um, at different stages of their career. Some of them a bit known, some of them unknown. One of them a welder a full-time welder. He has an entire shop in motion. We went to his shop. He makes money as a welder. But if you see this guy rap, it's bonkers. Like we spoke to him and we started hearing stories. Stories, right? So yeah, Road to Blue became that project that kind of put the spotlight on people that never will get the spotlight. Mm -hmm. Another creative expression of yours. And this is something that really resonated with me, which I think is even when what made me start digging into your story. <laughs> like, so you didn't care before? Like, who it's not, it's not, it's, so it's not that I didn't care, I just yeah. didn't really, I didn't know that This much. thing you said is very important for everybody to learn. Like, you don't know which one will resonate. Yeah. You know, that's why you, you can't, you don't wait till your shop is empty before you restock. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. You just have to just keep yeah, doing yeah. it into the world. Yeah. Was losing daylight. Yeah. At least I remember, so even me going to losing daylight, I think someone on my team had said, oh, this thing is happening. And I was like, ah, this is not this, but whatever. Cool. And then one random day in December, when it was showing at Echo Bank, I was at an event somewhere else. And I was like, you know what? What I'm going to do today is go and see this thing. Mm -hmm. And I went to see it and I was just mind blown. And not mind blown in terms of because the work you did is not like it's important work, but it's not stuff that it wasn't stuff that I didn't know. But what I liked or I enjoyed was like the 360 view of trying to understand and contextualize the history of film in Nigeria. And I like that you also didn't just focus on like the Nollywoodization. So I have three, two or three questions, like obviously in that, in one vein. So it's like one, obviously what inspired it? Two, like how did it make you feel? Like obviously seeing that expression come to life. And then thirdly, what's the next stage? Like how is it going to evolve? Losing Daylight was, it's probably, and you know when you have kids and you don't want to pick a favorite, mm -hmm. you know, but somehow you know your favorite. Yeah, yeah. 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 Losing the light is a very special baby, and I didn't know losing the light was like a five-year plan. It, there was no business, there was no reason. I had no business doing that thing last year. But the urgency of it, yeah, is alarming. It started basically by me um, obviously working in film and representing talent in film and doing some production work and always realizing the gap, yeah. the historical gap. It seems like it's not a problem. It seems like you can do without it. It's always uh, a problem. Yeah. I, to take you back to like my earliest days, my grandmother was 
a big film buff. Okay. Like big time film. She had every film. Like Nigerian, very low, everything in VHS cassettes. Where they know? She destroyed all of them. So the, the day I learned that she had destroyed them, that was when we collect, we started to collect. It like it shattered me. Because if we had half of our collections, mm -hmm. we we'll open a three-story museum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like she had a big house and under the bed, in a store, over the wardrobes, films. And she was moving houses. Our children built her a new house. And she just realized that this new house, where is she going to put all these things? She didn't understand how to store them yet further. And she packed all of it. A driver took her to her village and they poured everything down a well. Damn. Yeah, I had to describe it so that you know uh, 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 uh. how painful that was. No, but that's even just like picturing it because it's literally pouring knowledge. Yes. Like it's like literally you're pouring knowledge away. Down the well, right? So and I started thinking, wait, who else is doing this? Who else? Like, because the people that have all of this history, they are my grandmother's age. And what are they doing with this history right now? They're either destroying it or they're about to destroy it. It's one of those two. There are not a lot of people that really care so much about it anymore because they don't know how to how to evolve, how yeah. to impact the storytelling today and all of that. So the urgency went from something that should, you know, gradually happen to we have to do this now. And I started realizing that Nollywood as an industry or as a concept does not even know itself. The biggest problem, and people talk about our stories lacking identity, uh, it's because it's not well documented. There is an identity. Yeah. And it became important to me that to recollect this history in tangible forms. We will obviously do digital and digitize all of these things, but mm -hmm. immediately it was important to me to collect tangible history. And we started traveling around Nigeria. Who has this? Who has celluloid? Who has cameras? Who has costumes? Who has scripts? Who has VHS tapes? Who has VCDs? All of these things. And every everywhere we went to, we were, we were so close to it being destroyed. And we started collecting, and we didn't even know how to exhibit them. It, it was the collection. It was the most important thing. Now we are still collecting. That's the most important part of this thing. We constantly figure out how to preserve, how to restore, how to showcase them. You know, second really, but collecting them is just very important because there are people who work in film today who are 18 years old, who are 19 years old, and they were not born even when Nollywood got its name. Yeah. <laughs> you get. I I remember giving my my little um, nephew a VHS cassette. And I told him, tell me how to operate this. Yeah, okay. And I was like, where's the screen? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it just shows that like, in fact, I have, I have somebody that works with me who some of our items are stored in our apartment, right? And I told her that, oh, I need 30 VHS cases. Just bring them to me. And she brought VCDs. Oh. Yeah. This is a grown person, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you just don't know. I was film consumed over the years and how how does knowing that impact how you tell stories today if you could see thousands of scripts that are written in the 60s and 70s how would that impact the way you write today mm -hmm. if you see costume from the 60s and 70s and the 40s how would that in, in, inform how you design costume for characters today like i cannot overemphasize the importance of this street that this industry have. like we have we've not scratched the surface of what nollywood can be if we don't take care of that part, like it's, it's so important. And to your final question of how does, how did I feel um, when we did it? So we did a test run in October. Mm -hmm. It was a smaller version and we had over 1,000 people. And it's, it's losing the light is something you don't know you need until you see. Mm -hmm. So the first, it was just two days. The first day, you know, maybe a few people and when photos went out and news went out, the second day, there was no room, you know, and the people from different walks of life, from different parts of the industry. And I was just standing, I was, I was looking at it, and I'm like, why did this have to wait till now? Because I've read books, so many books about Nollywood, about colonial uh, filmmaking in Nigeria, and all of them always talk about the importance of preserving history, but nobody does it. I'm reading books about Nollywood written by white men, 
I have books. Like I'm like, <laughs> if we don't do this thing now, bro, they'll, do like, us. they'll do it for us, right? So, and it made me feel really good that I mean we could pull that off because it was really, really, really difficult. It's very political. Collecting tangible history is very hard in Nigeria because there are families involved. Yeah, the forefathers and forefathers who all these things, <laughs> you know. It's so hard, and that's what that's what we happen on our next step is to finally solve the, you know, political situations and open up a proper film museum in Nigeria. You know, you saying that also captured one of my favorite things about it. it's Ego Boyos, the the, the airband, yeah, the headband the that, band, from yeah. her personal yeah. personal collection and library, yeah. and I was like, yeah. Yeah. it was a big support, like, and if we had more people like Ego Boyo, yeah. We would have had a, an even more robust collection, but people people don't understand it yet, you know. And like every idea, you have to constantly show it. Yeah, show it. There are people who read it out to and they were like, no. There are people who read it out to and like, mm, I'm not sure. And there were people like that who were like, oh, I have everything, <laughs> you know, take it. And so we're going to do more exhibitions like that. But beyond that, Losing Daylight is actually a registered NGO now. Okay. Um, with a different name, it's the Museum of Nigerian Cinema and Arts because there will be a building that will okay. house all of these things. It's called the Monica, that's the acronym. And we are still raising a lot of money to make sure that happens. We want to, we want to have a conservation lab where these things can be digitized in real time. Mm -hmm. We want to host screenings of classics. We want to manage the estates of some of these legends and help them figure out ways to monetize their their works because look at what is happening with fella look mm -hmm. at how much work has been done in the in, in with his legacy and you look at the the, the theater and cinema counterpart who is probably uba to mm -hmm. and there is literally nothing you know i'm like so what what are the measures we can deploy to make sure that the estate of people that shape this industry are also well utilized and so so much there's also like a lot of advocacy work here yeah yeah Love Which is the part you're doing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I usually end these interviews by asking my guests two questions. So the first one is, if you were my producer for the day, I could book me any guests <laughs> possible. Who would you like to see on Overnight Success? So who sent me here? Nobody sent you here. So this, <laughs> only we, uh, this was okay. a, this was okay. a, this was a, we came to find you. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Chimezie Emo. Okay. Two people, or how many people? As many people as you want. She may or Nicola Sinugo. She's on the list. Yeah. It's been amazing work. Fuad, I don't know if you've had Fuad. Fuad's episode is going out today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people doing amazing stuff, but I think I'll, I'll stop there for now. Okay. A final question. So you sat down with me. You've allowed me to ask you all these questions. Yeah. Some of them invasive about your life <laughs> and your journey. Is there anything you'd like to ask me? Yes. Okay. What did you have this morning for breakfast? <laughs> Nothing, actually. I don't eat breakfast. You don't eat breakfast? No. I'm a one meal, I'm a one meal a day man, and that meal tends to be dinner. Wow. Because breakfast, it's just, I don't like working when I'm full. Okay. So okay. I try and stay as hungry as possible during the work day so that I can focus on the work. Well, are you a morning person? I'm a morning person. Now, we've great. had this conversation. Great, great, great. Yeah. Because like, there's, there's no other way. But let me ask you a more serious question. Okay. Right? How do you define, what was your earlier definition of success? And what, has it changed now, going forward in your life? What's... So when you say my earliest definition of success, so that's obviously when, the way I'm thinking about it is like when I was a child and you know. Be a doctor. I was, well, yeah, that, I mean, I'm a lawyer. So Ooh. maybe that, but like yeah. it was, uh, I want to be married, I want to have kids, I want to have plenty of money, yeah. I want to have a good job, all that stuff. But I think as I've gotten older and I have obviously, as one of my guys will say, I've become more jaded. That the edge I've kind of lost is apparently I'm giving heavy 30 plus energy these days. <laughs> and yep. I, I will say it's about fulfillment. So for me, it's not like obviously money is great. Like all the material things are amazing, but success for me is about how I feel about it. Mm. So 
being happy, taking joy in doing what I'm doing, and then also when it resonates with people. So when people tell me, oh, this thing you did, I really enjoyed it, or I really liked it, or this thing really helped me, that is like the most, that's the highest form of success for me because it means that whatever I've done is not just for me. It's, I feel you. it's had like a chain reaction. Totally feel you. How you feel about what you've done. Yeah. Okay, I've gotten my lesson. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Taiwo, for your time. Thank you. Thank very you much. for sharing um, such insightful answers with us and wishing you a lot of luck on your journey. Thank you. Thank you guys much. for watching Overnight Success. Catch you this time next week. Mm -hmm.